Hello Africa, it is Wednesday, the 8th day of November 2017. A very good evening and a warm welcome to your favorite Pan-African show, Bottom Line Africa. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim and the program begins right now. But first things first, let's now uh, take a look at Africa in 60 seconds. <music> Tanzanian authorities are investigating circumstances in which at least six students were killed near the border with Burundi. We'll tell you why which doctor is at the center of the fate of sacked Zimbabwean Vice President Emerson Nangagwa. The legal battle that we started would have been nothing. Four presidential candidates in Liberia form an alliance to challenge George Ware, even as the runoff remains uncertain. And tonight, from Kenya to Cameroon, from Nigeria to Western Sahara, why the increasing separatist voices across the continent? Good evening once again and uh, welcome once again to the uh, program. Uh, this is Bottom Line Africa and we have a lot lined up for you uh, in the program as you've already seen in the highlights uh, there. But on our Twitter poll tonight we are asking you, do you think those calling for secession have a justifiable cause? Do you think, do you believe those calling for secession have a justifiable cause? Of course this question is informed by what has been happening in Kenya, you know, at a time when secession politics, politics is gaining momentum. We've seen a section of NASA supporters, now NRM, calling for the country to separate. And we've also seen a number of leaders from the coast region saying they want to secede as well, and not forgetting the Mombasa Republican Council. And tonight in studio, we have individuals who are going to help me discuss this topic. We have Kosti Mandibe, he's a former Minister of Finance from South Sudan. We also have Abdi Wahab Sheikh Abdi Samad, who is a regional analyst, regional affairs analyst, and Peter Kaluma Homabe, member of parliament, as well as Honorable Owen Bayer. Uh, he's also a member of parliament from Kilifi North. We'd like to hear your feedback. Remember, our hashtag is bottom line Africa. Our Twitter handle is at KTN News. You can as well tweet me at Yusuf Ibra. But tonight, we want to begin our program from our neighboring country, that is Tanzania, where at least six children have been killed and more than 20 others injured in an explosion at a primary school near the country's border with Burundi. Now, the pupils apparently died when an object they were playing with exploded at the school in Kihinga village. Hospital doctor Maria Goreth Frederick said 25 people had been admitted for treatment. Three of the children are said to have died on the spot, while three others died while receiving treatment in hospital. Detectives have been dispatched to the school to investigate the incident. Meanwhile, Tanzanian uh, President John Pombe Magufuli has fired two municipal council heads after they failed to recall government allocations for road projects under their districts. Now, a statement from the presidency said the duo, the director of the Bukoba Municipal Council, Erasto Aaron Mfungale, and the director of the Bukoba Rural Municipal Council, Mwantum Kitwana Dao, were to be reassigned roles. Their dismissal is, however, linked to a public event in the Lakeside town of Bukoba, where Magufuli had gone to launch a new airport. Now, they were summoned to give figures on government allocations, but failed. And this is just part of the exchange witnessed on live television yesterday. Take a look. Fedha za road fundi ona zikumboka. Hapana mweshmua raisi, hela za road fundi labda aje mweka azina. Wewe sini mkurugenzi? Ndiyo, mimi ni mkurugenzi, lakini mimi na idara nyingi sana mweshmua raisi. Suwezi nikaweka kila kitu. Wezu kanijibu hivyo mimi, umenyerewa. Ndiyo, mweshmua raisi. Nataku niambie fedha za road fundi ni kiasi gani? Sizikumbuki kiasi gani lakini zililetwa. Naogopa kusema uongo. From Tanzania over to some developments in Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe's president Robert Mugabe has accused his sacked deputy that is Emerson Monangawa of consulting traditional healers to find out when the 93-year-old will die as a scheme to take uh, power, the state-owned Herald newspaper reports. 
Now, according to Mugabe, Mwangangwa first spread rumors that the president intended to retire in March, but when he realized that Mugabe was not living, he started to consult traditional healers on when the president was going to die. Now, addressing thousands of his supporters in the capital, Harare, Mugabe said Mnangawa lacked, quote-unquote, supreme discipline and tried to orchestrate what he termed as rebellious behavior in the ruling ZANU-PF party. Mugabe fired Munangawa, a close comrade of his, of his since the 1970s, a war for independence on Monday, in what analysts saw as a move to pave the way for his wife, Grace, to take power when he dies or retires. The journey is long, it has no shortcuts. There is no shortcut to the leader of the people. Just as there was no shortcut to our independence, we had to walk the long walk. The best thing we have is that uh, the vice president is safe. He is in a place where those would be who would have been assassins to the vice president can no longer reach to him. And he probably will be traveling very soon to Jobek. Now over to developments in Liberia, where four presidential candidates uh, met in Monrovia to discuss a potential merger, while, uh, while the runoff, which was to happen yesterday, was suspended by the Supreme Court until further notice. Now Charles Bramskin, the candidate uh, who brought a legal complaint against the Electoral Commission, hosted the meeting at the headquarters of the Liberty Party. Current vice president and finalist Joseph Bokai from the Unity Party, as well as Alexander Cummings from ANC, and Benoni Yure from the All Liberian Party are all backing the legal complaint of alleged frauds and irregularities during the first round of the presidential poll. Now, the second round of Liberia's presidential election was halted by the Supreme Court on Monday, and commentators expect the vote to be delayed for days or even weeks. The court ruled that it could not go ahead until a fraud complaint lodged by the Liberty Party candidate Charles Bramskin is first resolved. You cannot keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And because we may have had problems in the past with our elections, doesn't mean we should accept it this time around. And the one thing we're united on, and we're united on many things, but the one thing we're united on is that we do not believe the recent elections, the outcome of recent elections, reflect the will of the Liberian people. On this, we are united. I want to ensure, I want to thank our legal process, the Supreme Court, for being able to arrest the situation direct all of what <clears throat> NEC have done to ensure that Liberians will get what they deserve. The legal battle that we started would have been nothing without the support of each of my friends around this table. Because they came because they join us one way or the other, like we will, and our great great grandchildren stand to benefit. And still in the west of the continent and uh, Togo, thousands of people took to the streets in Togo's capital, that is Lome, on Tuesday, in the latest protest calling for the long standing President Faure Nasibe to step down. Now, the demonstration is the first of three planned marches this week and comes after more than two months of nearly weekly and uh, comes, uh, nearly weekly opposition actions against half a century of rule by the Nasibe family. Now, on Monday evening, the government indicated it was taking the necessary measures for the opening of a dialogue with its political detractors. Veteran opposition leader Jean-Pierre Fabre said they too were in favor of dialogue but to discuss the conditions for Faure and Asiebe's departure. Now, last month, some 500 Togolese nationals fled across the western border into Ghana to escape what they said were human rights abuses by the police and the military. We have traversed 25 dialogues. 
we've already been through 25 dialogues. If there needs to be dialogue, yes, it will be this one that has to focus on how to finally free our country. I came out because I'm not afraid. I'm Togolese. I fight for my nation, Togo. Togo is not a kingdom. 50 years of power is enough. My child can be in power. My son can be power. I can be president myself, so I'm out. If I have to die, I must die for my country. I believe that all political prisoners must be released. Everyone must regain the freedom for us to regain our serenity for exchanges that can help us find the right solution to this crisis. Over to the south of the continent now and in South Africa, thousands of taxi operators held protests in Pretoria's in a city demanding more government assistance in the form of licenses and subsidies. Now, drivers delivered a memorandum to the Department of Transport and a second memorandum to the union buildings. Transport was disrupted in the city and commuters resorted to trains and buses. Others got lift from passing motorists. The taxi operators were demonstrating over several issues, including a request for a government subsidy, licensing as well as operating permits. The mandate is that of us embarking on a peaceful protest march to go and deliver a memoranda. So I, I did not expect anything, you know, outside uh, those perimeters. We're talking about the unworkable tax recapitalization program, uh, the non-issuance of operating licenses to deserving operators, the lack of uh, subsidization of the tax industry, uh, issues uh, around the value chain, and the, the newly proposed uh, ARTO bill, just to name but a few. Now, a two-day forum on investment opportunities in Somalia's sustainable energy sector opened in the Somali capital, Mogadishu. Now, the participants are led by the federal government of Somalia, members of the private sector and international partners speaking uh, today's opening session. The special representative of the UN Secretary General for Somalia, that is SRSG, Michael Keating, lauded the three groups for coming together to address the energy uh, challenges for Somalia. Some speakers noted the adverse effects of 25 years of conflict and instability in hindering the development of Somali's energy sector. A United Nations expert on renewable energy, Andrew Morton, observed that the energy sector in Somalia is in the hands of the country's private sector, which has been receiving grants from the international community. This meeting today is about bringing the key stakeholders together who can contribute to a takeoff in access to energy, renewable energy, in Somalia. And each of us has a strong interest in making this happen. It's fairly unregulated. And even though some businesses are making money, it is very small compared to what could be done if the sector was more regulated. To date, Somalia's energy sector has relied on private companies with their own savings and on grants from the international community. But to really grow, it needs to bring in finance, it needs to bring in credit. And to get that happening, you need to set up the right environment, you need to have interesting projects and interesting businesses in which companies can invest. Now, let me return you back to the west of the continent and this time round over to the most populous country in Africa, that is Nigeria. Nigeria's oil minister will visit the Niger Delta this week in a bid to stave off a threat of more insurgent attacks in the area. Emmanuel Ibe Kachiku said that without more investment, it will be a struggle to ease tensions uh, and develop its main crude production or producing region. Now, the Niger Delta Avengers, whose attacks on energy facilities in the region last year helped push Africa's biggest economy into recession, said on Friday it had ended its ceasefire in its campaign for more of Nigeria's oil earnings. Kachiku said he will meet representatives of the militants and other stakeholders during a visit to the region on November 9th, that is tomorrow. The minister said the government needed to develop its oil and economy to deliver on promises of more cash for the Delta, with the right, which rights groups say has long suffered from pollution and poor investment, despite being the source for much of Nigeria's oil output of around 2 million barrels per day.
we need to start development. Uh, we also need to see whether there are potential ways without accepting liability for the players in that field to be able to put money back on the table. There are all kinds of models that we're going to be looking at. Um, where I am, I just need to generate money. Uh, money is one thing that this country needs. Uh, development is one thing that this country needs. Uh, transparency is fantastic and we need to pursue it, but we can't hold everything down while we're pursuing that because ultimately the guys in Niger Delta don't understand that. Uh, they want money on the table. Uh, so I expect that when there's a logical argument on the table, they tend to listen. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we don't go that path. It's, it's, uh, it's mutually destructive. It doesn't help anybody, both them and us, ultimately. Uh, so I, I am sure that, as like they did the last time, when they see a concrete action plan, they would listen. The development asset should not suffer because we're dealing with a, leg um, um, a legacy uh, transparency issue. So in 245, for example, if there are monies left on, the, left on the table or under the table that need to be paid, we need to look at that. But that's going to be determined by cost of competent jurisdiction. Now, over to the Congo Basin and Survival International is calling for a greater recognition from world leaders for tribal people's crucial role in protecting the environment at the ongoing climate conference in Bonn, Germany. Now, the conference, which takes place between November 6th and November 17th, is a follow-up uh, to the groundbreaking party climate talks in 2015 and brings together government representatives and activists from around the world, including some indigenous people, to discuss environmental issues. Now, survival has been leading the global call for a conservation model that respects tribal people's rights. This has been increasingly acknowledged by key international figures, including the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Indig Indigenous Peoples, Victoria Tollicoppers. <laughs> The Congo Basin Rainforest is the second largest in the world, and we've known for many years that it's a critical for biodiversity, animals and plants. With this discovery, we also learn that it's critical for the climate. We estimate we have a map of the central Congo peatlands published for the first time this year to show that it covers around 145,000 square kilometers. That's an area a bit bigger than the size of England, and we think it stores about 30 billion tons of carbon. That's as much carbon as all the emissions from fossil fuels, all the emissions from humanity globally for three years. So if we want to meet the commitments in terms of the Paris Agreement, then we really need to keep these peatlands doing the job of taking carbon out of the atmosphere rather than adding it to the atmosphere. No, Morocco's King Mohammed has ruled out any peace deal that allows uh, for the independence of the Western Sahara as the United Nations renews efforts to resolve their decades-old dispute. Now, a UN peacekeeping force has been deployed in the former Spanish colony since 1991 with a mandate to organize a referendum on its independence or integration with Morocco. And uh, Morocco agreed to the vote in 1988 agreement with a pro-independence uh, Polisario Front that ended 13 years of conflict, uh, but has since blocked it being held, saying it will accept only autonomy for the territory. Past experiences should make it possible to reflect on the obvious. The problem is not so much to find a solution to this case, but rather to define the process to be followed to achieve it. It is therefore incumbent upon the parties to the conflict, who are the originators of the dispute, to assume their full responsibility for seeking a final settlement. Full respect for the principles and the fundamental principles retained by the Security Council for the treatment of this artificial regional conflict. The UN body is in fact the only international body charged with overseeing the settlement process. Well, and that report takes us to a very short break, but when we return, as I've already told you, we'll have that discussion surrounding, of course, the politics of a secession at a time when Kenya is also having its own agenda. We've seen a part of the national supporters or now supporters of the National Resistance Movement calling for the country to separate. We've seen a section of coastal leaders 
you know, saying that they want to secede uh, from uh, Kenya, not forgetting the Mombasa Republican Council. But we're also going to go big with this debate, focusing on the continent. We'll have our panel ready with us right after this very short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Don't talk about it.